We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 in a, in a community series that we're going to be just starting this morning as we're done with Philippians and a transition from Psalm 37. I want to welcome you here this morning. If you're new here and you have one of those black Bibles, just turn to page 857. Page 857. The rest of you, figure it out. Um, <laughs> Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. We're going to go into the scriptures and read. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is God's word. Just a quick prayer. I'm going to steal it from Alistair Begg in the Anglican book. Father, what we know not this morning, teach us. What we have not this morning, Lord, give us. And what we are not this morning, Lord, make us. For Jesus' sake, amen. It's always hard for me as we go into a new series trying to start this thing out as we kind of tie everything all together and figure out where it is we're supposed to go and what it is I'm supposed to tackle and what's important for us to learn, what's not important for us and how I get to sort all those things out. It's always a, a prayerful thing for me to hear what it is the Lord has for us as we transition into something else. And it dawned on me as it always does that it... it it became very painful for me to take a look at and just understand that in the middle of a forced separation of this past year, a bunch of change has occurred in the midst of all of that. And one of the things that I hear more than anything else is the value of coming together as a community of believers, helping one another out, and really understanding that we actually had grown to take an awful lot for granted as the Church of Jesus. And we didn't really notice it until we didn't have it anymore. And I think in looking at the book of Acts, which is probably a really good place for us to go, at least in some key places, is all of it has value for us. But seeing a shift in the worldview of the early church and how it is they functioned, how it is they saw the temple, how it is they understood God's promises to them, and probably most importantly, how it was they were to gather together as a body of believers and why it was it was so important for them to do so. For those of you that were here all the way back at Easter, one of the things that we learned is that because of the resurrection of Jesus, the world from that point forward was never going to be the same again. Dead people don't rise to no effect. The world would never be the same again. In the middle of our history, in understanding this, heaven itself broke in upon humanity and we saw this Jesus walk out of a tomb. And although Jesus' followers didn't really understand that he wasn't going to be the Messiah that they wanted. In other words, they wanted a military leader. They wanted a political leader who would destroy Rome and all of the other parties that were around who didn't think the way his disciples did. That was the Messiah that they wanted. When we think that thought through, not a whole lot's changed in our world. Something that we should really take a look at. No, that long-awaited hope of the people of Israel was still in the future, and it is still in the future for us. But Jesus was, however, the Messiah that not only Israel needed, but he was the Messiah this entire world needed. The whole creation, because of the resurrection of this Jesus of Nazareth, was delivered from that death grip of sin. We are no longer bound to the way things were. That in Jesus, because of his death and his resurrection and walking out of the tomb, we as human beings have the forgiveness for the sins that we were talking about earlier today. That we are set right before God once again. There's nothing that we have to do to get us in a position that God is going to hear us. But rather, he has already done everything for us. We are able then to live out that genuine human life. Genuine human flourishing because of what it is Jesus did in and through the care of his Holy Spirit that is in us. That's why it's so important that we never minimize 
human life at every level. We then learned on Pentecost Sunday not too long ago that because the risen Jesus ascended back into heaven, that same Holy Spirit who lived in him and empowered him to do the things that he did now lives in us if we are believers in Jesus. And not only that, he then empowers us to be able to be witnesses about who this Jesus is and all of the things that he did in this world. The healing of the nations is what I like to tell people. The healing of the nations has happened and we are then sent out into this world as God's people to share that with the world. Not to become a member of some group or a member of some nation, but the understanding that because of what Jesus did, this world has finally been healed and we have the ability to live the way we're supposed to, regardless of where God has set us down. And that in this Jesus, there is salvation. There is forgiveness, there is life, and there is that beautiful and all-famous word that we hear a lot on the 4th of July, there is freedom. There is freedom. But it's not because of anything we did. It's because of everything he did. Go into the world. Go into the world, he tells us. And 2,000 years on, and as near as I can figure, some 5,500 miles away, here in St. Albans, on Independence Day, July 4th, 2021, here we are celebrating that spiritual independence. Both of the independence that we have, that we celebrate this Sunday morning, came at the cost of others. Our freedom is free at a lot of levels, but it always costs somebody somewhere. And that begs the question, how did we get here? How is it we're here in 2021? How did anyone come to Christ along the way? How do we help people still to come to Christ? Small beginnings that turn into long-term faithfulness in one direction. That's how. Small beginnings that turn into long-term faithfulness in one direction. You see, because every journey starts with what? One step. Every journey starts with a first step. It has a starting point. It has a place of formation and understanding that God's plan of fixing humanity in this world will be helped along and moved forward by guess who? Here's the scariest part of this whole game, actually not game, but this whole thing that Jesus left for us. His plan of saving the world gets to move forward by turn to your left and right and look at the person. By you. By the person you just looked at. Broken humanity has been given the responsibility to bring the plan of Jesus forward. As crazy as that seems for us today, as crazy as that seems for us today, we are not being led in some sort of haphazard, scattered, and sporadic way. No. God has called us as his people to shine in this world and to share Jesus. But that's never been accomplished in an independent Lone Ranger way. We are not meant to go it alone. But with every healthy endeavor, what we discover in the scriptures is that there's always one or two people that stand out. We have to acknowledge that and admit that. But it seems to me that the healthiest way in which we move forward, Dave talked about independence, and he touched on this word and the things that he said. What we need and what we have to have as a body of believers is a healthy interdependence upon one another. Bringing together all of our gifts, all of our ideas, all of the things that God has put us here for, we put them all together and we work interdependently as individuals in launching out into this world. You see, the community of believers united in a way that gives us today a good pattern for us to grow in. So I want us to take the next five weeks through the book of Acts. One of our main goals is to learn how we come back together as a healthy group of individuals. What it is God has for us as a community on mission in this world and in our community that he set us down in, right in St. Albans and in Franklin County. And here in Acts chapter 2, Luke gives us the seeds for success. It's the long introduction to the short dissertation, as Rob Weeks always used to say, to the long story of the old rugged cross. So here we are where I want us to be. Everybody still with me so far? Good. Because he gives us the seeds of success even in our hard times. Most especially in the hard times. 
As I said in our prayer, growing together in the easy times will ensure that we can continue to be together and grow together in the hard times. So this morning, let's look at five things. For those of you who need to take notes, five things that we're going to look at as the foundational pieces for our journey in Acts. Number one, this morning, we're going to look at the apostles' teaching. Number two, we're going to understand that the people brought themselves under the authority of the apostles. Number three, that they all gathered together regularly. Four, they broke bread in their homes, communion, which we're going to partake of. And number five, and I think probably the one we all need the most, is that they were in constant prayer. Constant prayer. So I don't have 16 points. I have five for you today. Should get us out before the ice cream melts. But the important thing... (laughs) The important thing for everyone to recognize was that God had called the apostles specifically to be the teachers of God's word. Specifically to be the teachers of God's word and the one who would lead and carry the authority in the church. Now this is probably not your normal sermon. This is more of a teaching thing, but I think it's good for us to understand. They devoted themselves to the apostles' what? Teaching. You see, God always had certain people that he called specifically to speak for him on his behalf with the people that he needed to challenge. We have Moses, for example, who was called specifically to go to Pharaoh. Not exactly, in his words, the most competent person to do so because he had a bit of a stutter, but he was called to go before Pharaoh and let Pharaoh know what he was supposed to do. All of the prophets in the Old Testament were called by God to challenge the kings of their day to do things right. Not to let the kings know that they were awesome and pat them on the head, but to let them know to do things right. All the way up to John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, he was going about rebuking kings and those who were leaders in the church or the synagogue of the Jewish nation, letting them know all the things that they were doing wrong. This is what you're supposed to be doing. God always has people that he sets up to let everyone know what his word says. And we see here in Acts as well. We see Peter in Acts chapter 2 in his first sermon on the day of Pentecost. We didn't touch on that then, but it's important that we talk about it today because we did talk on Pentecost Sunday that it was very clear that this Apostle Peter was not the same person that we find in the Gospels. Something significant had happened on that day of Pentecost. The Peter that we see in this sermon acts and speaks with boldness. He is not afraid. He speaks with confidence that comes from the Holy Spirit. He speaks with authority as if he has been one who was told these are the words you're supposed to say to these people. And if you take a look at verses 14 through 35, which is your homework for today, take a couple minutes to read it here in chapter 2, he unpacks the Old Testament. And what is a synopsis of what was probably a very long sermon, because you can read through that in about a minute and a half, I don't think that Luke gave us everything that Peter had said, but it's a synopsis of what happened there. He's circling around and he's pointing to Jesus as the fulfillment of every single thing that he's talking about in all of God's promises in Acts chapter 2. And he brings the crowd and himself to a place of three things, application, conviction, and then finally he brings them to a place of repentance. Peter the Apostle And he says in Acts 2.36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. He then says in verse 38, that's not going to be on your screen because I added it after. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, what was going on here is that Peter, just like every single preacher ought to do, took what he was trying to teach these people and he had applied it to himself first. So he was preaching with that conviction that was there. He knew that he had rejected Jesus on that night that Jesus was arrested. He denied him three times and his world completely fell apart. As a human being, he couldn't even hold it together long enough for a 12-year-old girl to be challenged by his notion that, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Didn't work. But this isn't the same guy we have here that denied who Jesus was. But over the course of these days, Peter had come to repentance. Peter had understood that on his own, he was never going to make it work. And on the shores of Galilee, after cooking him a breakfast, the Lord Jesus forgave him. And the Lord Jesus restored him. Don't ever think, as I always say, that you are so far gone that you are too far gone. None of us are ever in that place. 
So Peter here isn't preaching something he doesn't get as an apostle. No, he is under the authority of the scriptures and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's what makes him so powerful in his preaching. It's also what makes him so compassionate and passionate about what it is he's pleading before these people. Let's remember something here. For those of you who know your Bibles, let's think this through. For those of you who don't, you're going to learn this morning that these are the people whom had Jesus killed. These are the very people who ordered him to be handed over to the Romans in order that he would be crucified. And these are the same people who wanted to do that very thing to the followers of Jesus. And these are the people Peter is standing before. He doesn't want to destroy or eliminate them. And that's really important for all of us to understand here in 2021. Think it through. Peter's not standing before this crowd talking to the other group of people. That's not what's going on here. He's not doing that. That's today's terms, where we would take a look at this group of people in a part of our culture that we don't like. And we want to cancel. We want to wipe the whiteboard clean and say these people don't matter. They don't exist. Their opinions are of no value to us. Therefore, we're just going to erase them from the pages of history. That's not what Peter's doing here. What I will tell you right now is if we operate in that kind of theology, we are walking on dangerous ground. And it is a theology. It's a worldview that says that if you don't think the way I do, you have no value in my world. That's not what the Bible teaches. And it certainly isn't what Peter's teaching here. Remember, the people that are in front of him wanted him dead. And yet, he is full of compassion for them. Why? Because we face our past. That's why. We understand the things we do wrong in the past. And then we figure out how it is we can learn from the things we do wrong in the past and grow forward. And in that, we understand the grace of God that turns into compassion. We are all broken people. Every single one of us sitting here today, we are all broken people, sinners in need of Jesus. We need to walk away from our independence, as it were, and become interdependent upon him for what it is he has done for us. Ultimately, what this leads to is this is the pastor's office today. No, I'm not looking to guarantee my job and make sure I continue to get paid. But the reality is is that's what Peter's doing. He's shepherding a people. And Paul expands on this when he says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for works of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Listen, we... I don't have time to unpack that. I would love to be able to do that. But it is primarily the office of pastor teacher today that does the things that Peter was doing here. The gift of apostleship, the gift of prophetic gift, that's all there. But I don't have time to unpack that. So for those of you who don't hear me say that, it's not that I don't believe that. It's just that I only have a limited amount of time. But when it comes to the primary preaching and the teaching, it is a teaching elder. It is a pastor who does that today with what Peter is doing here. And a pastor who doesn't preach in this way, who doesn't have passion for what it is they're preaching, who doesn't have compassion upon the people whom he is preaching to, who doesn't really put himself first under the authority of Scripture and say, where do I need to grow, really ought to examine themselves. I need to examine myself if I am not in that spot. They brought themselves under the apostles' teaching. That was the first thing that made them healthy. The second thing was that people brought themselves under the authority of the apostles. They understood that God had given authority to particular people. As Paul tells us, they were actually given his gifts to the church. They didn't question everything that was said. They didn't argue with everything that was said. But they understood that these people were given in order to help the church grow in a healthy way. And being under the authority of someone who preaches and teaches scriptures faithfully helps us all to be, guess what? Well-discipled people who understand the scriptures. Now, that doesn't mean you're not responsible for your own personal study. We'll get to that. But it does mean there, again, there are always certain people that are called to do these things. We have to take personal responsibility for our daily devotional times. You're not going to get to know who Jesus is in five minutes a week. It's not going to happen. 
It just isn't going to happen. Part of your personal devotional time has to be the bringing of your family to the community gathering once a week. I'm preaching to the choir because y'all are here, but nonetheless, part of our daily devotions and part of our devotions during the week is to make sure we get to a place that we call church. I'm going to say it again. I've said it before and I'll say it many more times. That to think that you never have to gather together in church because you can get God communing with nature and hiking and walking and enjoying all of his creation is an incomplete way of doing things. I didn't say it was wrong. I just said it's incomplete. You can do that. However, it's only part of what it means to be a healthy disciple. The other part of what it means to be a healthy disciple is to be together with the community of believers. And now that there is absolutely no reason why we can't gather together, every believer should do their best to do so. That's why he wrote in Hebrews 10, a verse that we've gone through over the course of the last year. And I say this in all genuineness and with no disrespect. The majority of the people who are so angry that we refuse to open up when we were asked not to open up, I don't typically see now that we can be here. I don't say that in any disrespect. I just say that as a pastor. Let's examine ourselves and let's understand. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. That's the writer of the Hebrews. It's a great statement. Now what follows that statement helps us to know our hearts and how it is we're supposed to. Let us consider how to what? Stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's a reason why we're here. There's a reason why we need to be here. It's not a guilty thing. It's a healthy thing for believers to gather together. If they hadn't learned to do this at the very beginning, forming good habits as people who believe Jesus, they never would have been able to grow in the long-term faithfulness that God had been driving them to. They never would have had the ability and the capacity to be the people of God in the world so that we could be sitting here today. We are beneficiaries of their faithfulness to gather. Good teaching, good discipleship, grown by being in good community together, under the authority of the apostles and the prophets and the pastors and the teachers. And number three, they met daily. They got together daily. Now, I don't have any idea. I can't figure it out. My commentaries of all 3,000 people as a group just kind of descended upon the temple every day. Don't know. Don't care. Perhaps they did. Perhaps they didn't. I'm not sure. Luke is careful to tell us, however, that they somehow at some level gathered every day. That's important for us to know and understand that they were in the temple, and that they were breaking bread. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's number four. That's the breaking of the bread. Really, what that is is communion. So what I would say for us today is whether or not it's in the temple, if you come here every day and decide to sit in this room, the building's open, go for it. No one's going to tell you to leave. But more importantly, what's really going on is that they gathered That's the point, whether it be large group or small. And in gathering together, they focused on breaking bread. What is that? That's the communion, something that we're going to do at the end of service today. But it is how they remembered and honored Jesus. They knew that the reason why they got together was not primarily for each other. Although that was important, it was to remember who Jesus is and was and what he had done for them, to build each other up in the middle of that. It's a healthy pattern and it's a healthy habit for every Christian to have. It's a tough one, I know. But growing friendships, growing friendships is critical. Getting together to talk and to pray. I can promise you right now, I would have never survived this week had I not known that groups of people within this body were praying. The Douglas family would not have made it from Sunday to here if it were not for the fact that they knew that people were gathering together and praying. It's the only thing that sustains any of us because we need to be encouraged to know via a text message that, hey, buddy, I'm praying for you. How you doing? I've said it before. I continue to say it like a broken record. That little word of encouragement 
I don't think any of us really understands how powerful that is when we are holding on by a thread sometimes that a community member cares enough to say, I love you, buddy, and I'm thinking about you, and I'm praying for you. It's essential to listen to one another's struggles. Sometimes all you need to do is buy somebody a cup of coffee, put it in front of them, and shut up. It's not a gift I have, but there you have it. Some of you do. Use it. Just to listen to people, just to understand where they're coming from. That's all they need sometimes. Listen, there is 168 hours every week. Genius that I am, Google helped me out with that one. 168 hours in a week. I am asking for one hour and 15 minutes every Sunday that we gather together here. And that is what is spent together as a community of believers here at Church of the Rock. One hour, 15 minutes. And that gives us encouragement in worship and in prayer and in song and in the preaching of the word. But that's not all we need. How many of you eat once a week? Not me. How many of you eat once a week? None of you. You'd starve to death. This is nothing but the buffet table to get us throughout. To give us stuff to chew on. To hang out together with friends by a fire. To talk about what God is doing in our lives. Because Wednesday is going to hit some people pretty hard. And if they know they've got somebody they can go to, guess what? They go to them. They gathered together every day. They wanted to be together in their small groups. They met in the temple. They broke bread in their homes. They grew together. They trusted one another with their issues and they trusted their leaders as a result of all of these things. To be honest, for so many of us throughout this past year, isolation and the inability to gather was maddening for those of us who talked to, well, everything. It's not even everyone, everything. And I understand that there are introverts among us um, I know one very well who obviously said on a regular basis that they trained their whole life for pandemics such as that and were quite happy. Nothing really changed in their life. They just kept going on as if nothing was different. I am not one of those people. And my lamp didn't talk back to me in my home office when I wasn't allowed to leave the house. We aren't wired, even you introverts, we're not wired to go at it alone. We're not wired to go it alone. It is God who has created us for community. We are to be knit together. When we are all going about and doing our own thing, focusing on just our own things, we lose that sense of belonging and we lose that spirit of unity that ties us together as a people. See, this fiercely independent American mindset is what makes us a great nation. The fiercely independent American mindset is what makes us a great nation. I'm going to throw this out to you to just chew on. I saw this this week, and it struck me. Kitty Hawk in 1903, where man first learned how to fly. Apollo 11, the eagle has landed, 1969. A very short 66 years from a sandy beach in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina to the landing spot on the moon. Our fierce American independence helps us to accomplish a great many things. However, it can far too often turn us into second-rate Christians. Now, breathe Put down the book you're going to throw and let's relax for a minute. Because I don't want to make anybody angry, but there's some important things that we have to take a look at by way of this early church. They were primarily made up of Jewish believers and they were fiercely proud of being Jewish people. And that ends up being one of the biggest issues that they faced. If you come next week, you're going to learn that. Far too often, division was caused because of the Jewish first, Jesus second mentality of many within the church you see gentiles a lot of people believed had to become jews first and then jesus would somehow accept them we're going to see that outworking again of that problem next week in acts chapter six it's a mentality that we are struggling with today here in the united states of america and as a pastor i can't avoid it because i talk to a lot of other pastors and this is a distraction for the church 
We all need to be reminded that we are citizens of heaven first. Of heaven first. The Bible tells us that we are strangers and we are aliens in this world. Then, second, we are citizens of whatever nation God has set us down in. Of whatever nation God has set us down in. Now, we are blessed to be Americans. I'm not saying that we aren't. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else except the country that God has put me down in. But, and I've said this before, I can only be the best American citizen I can be if I am a Christian first and an American second. If anything gets in the way of me being a Christian first, I have to re-examine myself. Now, I leave that with you to think through. You can't come and have a conversation with me. I'm not anti-American. I am not, just to make that clear. I am a pastor who understands that we have a position and a place in this world as God's people. And we have to be Christians first. The church is built around that truth. The church is built around that truth that the community of believers in Jesus transcends country. It not only transcends country, it transcends location. The church is about Jesus Christ and him crucified, first and foremost. Anything that gets in the way of that, and we are on very shaky ground. A church united and a church gathered around that truth will then be the best citizens of whatever country God sets you down in. Do you see the order? It's not an either or. It's a both and, but it's got to be a both and in the right way. Because if we are united in and around and for Jesus... The beauty is is that where we have landed, we have such an opportunity in our country to share Jesus and his salvation message of the kingdom. And I fear at times that that is lost because of the disunity that we are fighting against or trying to, of that fierce independent mindset that we are somehow American Christians. The word itself is backwards. And it's an unhealthy focus on power in the here and now and not in the ultimate of what will be. And that's something that we really have to get our hands on. We cannot focus on the here and now, although being the best citizens means we do. But we are the best citizens as Christians first. And the unifying factor to all of these things, and it is with this that I close, and probably most of you are saying, thank you, I just want my ice cream and I want to go home. The unifying factor to every single one of these things is constant prayer. Constant prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Let's not miss that. Praising God and having favor, verse 47 says, with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Remember we learned last week about King David say the meek will inherit the land. How Jesus expanded that whole thought to say what? The meek will inherit the whole earth. This is a global mission we have, not a land-specific mission that we have. The church of Jesus Christ is called to the nations. They are called to the nations. Not a specific piece of earth, but to the nations. And sometimes, sometimes the challenge that we face in the United States of America right now is that God is bringing the nations to us. And we seem to have a problem with that. Now, I'm not saying throw the laws out the window, but there are a good many places on planet Earth that Christians can't go to. And knocking on the doorsteps of the most beautiful country in the world are people from those nations coming to us. Are we taking that opportunity to share the gospel with them? Or are we just concerned that they're here? Now, again, I'm not saying throw laws out, so don't hear me. Sometimes he brings the nations to us. How are we handling that? Are we doing it in the right way? 
Are we celebrating the opportunity to have the chance to reach people who we could never otherwise reach because we can't get into their country? Because there's a good many times when he is sending them to, or he's sending us to them. That's where we support our missionaries. Why it is we support them in such a good way? The early church was also the sent ones. They did not stay in Jerusalem. They went out because they were under a common mission. They were united in prayer. And they knew that not the whole world would end up in Jerusalem. That they would have to go out. And they would have to just reach the whole world by leaving the comfort zone that they had. Are we prepared to do that? To welcome those nations in the beautiful country that we live in? in a way that opens up the door for the gospel of Jesus. A thought and a quote, and then communion. Our founding fathers gave us the beautiful freedoms that we have, and I am so deeply thankful for them. My son serves, as a matter of fact. Most of my family served. I really never joined because I didn't really care too well for the haircuts. My earring and the mullet that I had was just the world to me. <laughs> and I didn't want to give that up. It took my wife until 1997 and long after it wasn't, not that it was ever cool, but long after it was cool for her to convince me I needed to get rid of that. But our founding fathers gave us the beautiful freedoms that we have. And they were founded on a Judeo-Christian worldview. There's not another worldview that this planet has to offer that would have given us the country that we have. It's found here. That every human being has value. That everyone is created equal. It's the Bible that gives us the ability to have the country we have. And it is God's grace that keeps it. Perhaps. Perhaps in our thankfulness for that, we can continue to use those freedoms for the glory of our King in the sharing of the gospel because we have that guaranteed to us. There's a world to reach. Sometimes it's right on our doorsteps. There's a world to reach. There's a people to tell about Jesus. And we should be making sure that we are exercising every bit of freedom that we have to best follow the pattern that we see here to share the gospel. It creates proper focus and proper health for the church as well as a good witness which declares Jesus first and everything else second. That's the important thing. Jesus first, everything else second. And then I want to read a quote to you from Spurgeon who I like a lot. Just in thanks to you all as your pastor as Marty prepares to come on here in a month it struck me this morning and I've said it before and I just I have no time left and so I'm actually over my time wow I'll just read it Charles Spurgeon was convinced that he could preach the same sermons to great effect if only his people might pray for him on one occasion, when asked why his preaching was apparently so effective, Spurgeon replied, very simply, my people pray for me. I am a grateful pastor because I have a praying church. I have a praying people. And I think that this body is blessed as a united body because you pray together. Mm -hmm.